You're listening to Life, the Universe, and Everything Else. Today on the show, Semantic Grey Goo. Life, the Universe, and Everything Else explores the intersection of science and society. Original music is produced by Ian James, and this episode was edited by Marissa McCool. Find her on Patreon at patreon.com slash QAF. My name is Jem Newman, and with me today I have Lauren Bailey. Hello. Laura Creek Newman. Hi there. And Ashlyn Noble. Hello. So today we are talking about generative AI. So I said semantic gray goo off the top, and I feel like I need to explain myself a little bit. Listeners may be familiar with the the gray goo scenario, which is a thought experiment in the field of existential risk, where folks, particularly sci-fi minded folks, are concerned that if we develop self-replicating nanobots, so like mini robots or nanorobots, that are programmed to replicate themselves and are not programmed particularly well, they may begin consuming matter at an alarming rate and turning all matter that they encounter into more of themselves. And so the entire biosphere of the Earth could be consumed and used to manufacture more nanobots, and the Earth would become a sea of gray goo. See Stargate for one example. Sure. So semantics is the study of meaning. Sure, he says. Like, he doesn't make 500 fucking Star Trek jokes every episode. (laughs) (laughs) I'm afraid that I only watched, I think, the first two seasons of SG-1. And I never really cared for Atlantis. Although I did eventually come around on Khal Drogo. (laughs) Semantics is the study of meaning. So when I say semantic gray goo, what I'm gesturing at is the idea that As the internet becomes increasingly flooded with meaningless content output by generative AI, true, informative, meaningful content, whether it's news, science, culture writing, what have you, will be drowned out, and what little meaningful content remains will be consumed by large language models, and then regurgitated into more meaningless slop. Information written by people will be increasingly difficult to find, as the rate at which this slop, this semantic gray goo, is created by generative AI rapidly outpaces anything that humans can produce. And anything that they manage to produce is just fed back into the machine. So, I see one potential downside of this AI boom that we're currently seeing. I mean, the end of the world as your potential downside. (laughs) As as an informational or a semantic gray goo scenario. Death of the internet. And just to remind listeners, I'm not without sin here, but I will be casting stones. Uh, (laughs) I graduated in 2007 from the University of Manitoba with an undergraduate degree in computer science with a specialization in artificial intelligence. And I worked in machine learning for about a decade. Heretic. (laughs) But as we will discuss later, I have turned my hammers against the machines. Workers who felt their livelihood threatened by automation flung their wooden shoes called sabots into the machines to stop them. Hence the word sabotage. Here's a Star Trek joke for you, Ashlyn. It's a a, a second level Star Trek joke. It's more a meta Star Trek joke. It's Kim Cattrall. Yeah. So... Right now we're in this AI boom. At least the 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 tech boosters will tell you that we're in this AI boom with this new form of generative AI. So so what I want to explore in this episode is what generative AI is, what it is doing, and how we can stop it. <laughs> <laughs> we won't be getting into that so much, although I do think it may burn itself out as we'll discuss later, but First, I want to sort of talk about what this AI is and what it isn't. So generative AI is a form of program or algorithm or multiple forms of programs or algorithm that that create some sort of 
putatively creative output. So <laughs> tell us how you really feel, Jim. You you're basically going to put in a prompt of some sort that could be words, that could be other images, and it's going to spit something new or something different out. This has a long history. It's not really new. The Eliza chatbot from oh so many decades ago, the the first real famous chatbot, was a form of generative AI, albeit a very simple one, and I believe a deterministic one. I don't recall the details off the top of my head. What we have right now is more complex. It is less deterministic, meaning that if you put in the same output, it will sometimes give you different results. But it still isn't fundamentally intelligent, and it still fundamentally functions in a similar way. And it can turn to Nazism real quick. (laughs) (laughs) So when we talk about words, when we're generating words, what we're talking about are large language models, or LLM. And they're, they've also been described as stochastic parrots, which parrots, is... like the bird? Parrots, yes. yeah. So the way they work is you feed them huge corpuses of data, huge amount of input, and you train them to sort of recognize certain patterns of input, and they will, based on those patterns, guess at what should come next. So they function, I'm sure many people listening to this and many people on this panel have played with the autocomplete features on their phones before, where you type a word and then you'll have three suggestions and you hit the middle one over and over and over again and see what it spits out. And it will spit out something vaguely resembling a sentence some of the time. (laughs) Mine get real dark real quick. (laughs) And and we, depending on the the phone in question and the, the version of the model it's using, those will be trained on your specific output. So they'll be more likely to create something that is more plausibly like you. Real dark, real quick. <laughs> <laughs> so the way these these large language models work is really just like that. Those three things that pop up when it's suggesting the next thing for your autocomplete. Those are the three most likely things that it guesses should come next in the sentence. So when always you... type the word penis in oh. every single message you send. <laughs> we will get to that later, Lauren. <laughs> so these large language models, they essentially work just like a more complicated version of that with just a much larger data set to work with. They are stochastic, meaning they are they are pulling from a probabilistic model that is in some senses random, but in some senses deterministic. So it's probabilistically determined. So, and these have been around for for quite a while. Probably 10, 12 years ago, I made a Twitter bot using an earlier version of, (laughs) I guess you could call it a small language model called a Markov chain which is an old way of generating text, that basically took the works of Ayn Rand and Lewis Carroll and combined them. And so I had a Twitter bot that I called Alice's Adventures in Objectivism (laughs) that mashed those two up. And it was like a fun, silly experiment and a a totally hateful one. (laughs) But it, it is really what I'm saying is this generative AI stuff is not new. Right. Mm-hmm. The, the newer models are trained on more data and produce more impressive results. You can tell it to make me a computer program that will play a game of chess, and it will copy a bunch of stuff from Stack Overflow, just like a programmer would, and play a game <laughs> of chess. And nobody ever reads the tags. But that doesn't mean that it's actually intelligent. And most specifically, it does not mean that the program itself has any fundamental understanding of what you asked it. It is literally just looking at the words and saying, statistically, what should come next? Hello, world. I was just thinking it's probably mostly both, but are the data sets able to be trained on so much more data now because there just is so much more data? Like, I feel like that's obviously true. But how much of it is that the companies are so much less ethical with data now? Hmm. So that's a that's a fair question. And there's actually an additional piece that that I'd like to touch on there. We do have a lot more data now. That is definitely one piece. 
we do have a lot of companies. So, so we have a lot of data because we have access to the internet, but we also are all generating a lot more natural language right. than we used to because There's we're typing so it all into social media, time. for example. We also are all signing terms of service for use of these free services in which we are the product, right? Mm-hmm. Our data, the way, the way these services services are free is that our data is harvested and sold to advertisers and other people. And the way Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, etc. make money, not that Twitter makes money, <laughs> the way they all work is by harvesting our data and selling it and putting ads in front of us based on that data. If you like can't that. tell what the product is, you are the product. Exactly. And if you're if you're not paying for it, <laughs> you mm-hmm. are the you are the product. Except for this podcast, which we do out of the goodness of our hearts, <laughs> and our misanthropy. Another piece, though, Ashlyn. So so I think it's both and, right? Not not either or. It is both and. But the other piece is we have a large amount of compute infrastructure that is available and advances in CPU and specifically GPU, so the, uh, the, the type of parallel processing that is used in graphics processors, lends itself to certain applications better, and we're making a lot more of them. So the same kinds of processors or similar processors that are used by NVIDIA to run video game graphics are used to parallelize the computing power that goes into mining cryptocurrency which so is less lucrative now that we're Yay. like using for AI we could be using to learn how to like fold more proteins or find really big prime numbers instead we could absolutely that's another upsetting thing that i didn't know thanks jim <laughs> that was actually we're not going to talk about this in detail but there is a company right now that is allowing gamers to rent out the the spare time that they're not using their gpus to generate ai porn oh of all the things, like... <laughs> well, they had to appeal on. to the gamers. Protein. I say that as somebody who, yeah. You could you could find wild animals on game cams instead. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. But while we have a lot more data available, <laughs> we don't have as much data as we need. OpenAI, Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, the once and future CEO of OpenAI, <laughs> the once and current CEO of OpenAI, that saga is another one that we won't get into, but it was funny. He has talked at length about the fact that there is still not enough data needed to make these models actually any good <laughs> at being at convincingly generating realistic images or realistic text. You'll notice that these models are cool and impressive, but I heard it described by somebody as kind of like going to a kindergartner's Christmas concert. Mm -hmm. It's neat that this little tyke can actually produce something that sounds kind of reasonable, but I don't want to listen to it all the time. And a lot of prodding had to go into that product. (laughs) Sure, sure. And it comes out sounding like this, and I really want to get my lines out, and I don't want to forget my lines. (laughs) So AI can produce creative output in some senses, count the fingers but it's not particularly interesting at this time it will probably continue to get better but we are reaching the point rapidly of diminishing returns we need more data and uh, we (laughs) they need more data it needs more data feed feed it (laughs) feed the machine and one of the problems is we're, we're running out of it. Another problem is the internet, which is the prime source of this data, is getting so flooded with the output of generative mm-hmm. AI that you have – this term is delicious. It was coined by Jathan Sadowski, who's the co-host of the This Machine Kills podcast. We're running into what he calls Habsburg AI. <laughs> AI that is so inbred – it is unable to... <laughs> Lauren is dying over there. <laughs> breathe, please, breathe. <laughs> Inbred AI. <laughs> it, it is essentially unable to, to generate the output that it used to be able to because it is trained. It's fed its own dog food. It's trained on its own oh, no. output or the output of other generative models. Every simile is more gross. So, so you run into uh, model collapse, 
where where the models simply can't generate output anymore. Now, this is a problem that the Silicon Valley VCs are assuring us that they will solve, Mm -hmm. and they probably will to some extent. But in the meantime, they're flooding the internet with garbage, paraphrased news articles that are contributing to the ongoing death of journalism, where every time an actual journalistic outlet does some reporting and creates an article, it's run through 10 different chat GPT paraphrasers, and then the same article is spit out onto a whole bunch of websites full of spam and affiliate links and ads that try to gamify Google so that they show up in Google News and the original articles don't. It used to be, if an article didn't have a byline, the writer just didn't want their name associated with it. Now there is no writer and now, no editor. <laughs> now there <laughs> often is a, a fake byline because nobody wants to read AI-generated garbage. Alan so it's, Smithy. Yeah, yeah. so it's a bunch of Alan Smithies with profile photos that are created by Midjourney. Oh, I've I got something in my segment about creepy profile photos. I'm so, sure Ashwin does too. If we're going to follow the whole AI is just a kindergartner metaphor here. When kindergartners bring home their copious volumes of art, you look at them and you go cool and there's a very direct like daycare to home to trash pathway that you follow with this. You keep a couple of them, yeah. and the vast majority does that, because otherwise you would end up with a house full of crap. So why are they not doing that? Why don't they have the like the AI equivalent? as Because they keep talking about how everything's only training and only training, with my air quotes here. So why why haven't they done that? Why do they just feed it back in and fill up this world with crap. It feels like it's an easy answer, but they're not doing it. Well, it should all be piped to dev uh, slash dev slash null. I I agree. (laughs) But they're not intentionally doing this. I mean, so so they are and they aren't. OpenAI is experimenting with ways to generate content that can be plausibly used to train their models without causing model collapse. <laughs> that's like that's a Habsburg theory if I've ever heard one. The, the, <laughs> the, the Vault Thirty Three protocol. Okay, sh- you know, sh- sh- cousin stuff is okay for a little while, but <laughs> it's not a it's not a what, it's not a sustainable solution. Yeah, uh, what, for repopulation. Yeah. What a surprisingly good show. But most of this is just the fact that these models are the 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 corpuses that are used to train them are scraped from the internet. And the whole internet is being filled by other people with AI-generated spam. Yeah. And these models don't don't or can't distinguish when you're pulling in the training data. I get that. What I'm saying is that the people who made – the humans who made these models – should look at this trail of trash and be like, it needs to go straight into the garbage instead <laughs> of back into the feed. <laughs> well, but th- then it's not going to generate dollars, which it isn't. But, but we'll talk about that dollars. later. Why don't we talk more about chatbots, Laura? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Now that you're good and angry. Oh, I just, it's very annoying. And every, like, I see ads or there was a webinar that came up during Nutrition Month about AI and nutrition. And I'm just like, nope, hard no. (laughs) So no, not even interested. Like, like what? Like, what are you going to do? Right. Like, I, I don't know if any of you have heard, but there's there are AI-generated recipes that are floating around out there, <laughs> oh, along yeah. with their pictures. Gem will link to that. I remember AI-generated recipes from a few years ago that were, like, just so hilariously bad. Yeah. Like the cream so, cheese wrapped in soup. <laughs> yeah. So, so they're making a resurgence just because everything is AI, right? I and mean, the pictures to go with them are pretty, pretty swell sometimes. We're not going to talk about that too much, but just, I just... What? So oh, anyway. I, I I just wanted to share my favorite example from an AI generated recipe. Um, <laughs> there's a recipe that calls for three and a fifth teaspoons of, of one of the ingredients. Yeah. Another one that calls for one cup of monito sauce, which is not a thing that exists. <laughs> 
ranch, no special abilities. <laughs> um, Say that like half the time we get the ranch out of the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> it was an AI generated Pokemon list. Oh, ranch, yeah. Ranch, no special no abilities. Special abilities. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a bottle of Hidden Valley Ranch. <laughs> That's the picture. <laughs> That's, that's that's actually really great. I love I that. <laughs> there are a few things that 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 AI is good for and and making like nonsense bullshit is one of them. There is a there is a very funny AI generated yearbook that I saw posted. Oh, no. That there were like four people named Poosh or something no. like that. It was it was Bort. Bort. Yeah, they had Bort. My name is also Bort. <laughs> I was just like, did this train on The Simpsons? <laughs> truly. Truly. Yeah. And, yeah. and Shemp. Sh- yeah, just no, like, Shamp. Shamp. Just, and anyway. Jem, Jem, we're talking about chatbots. Stop it. Jem could talk about AI forever. I could and I will. I know. I'm so glad that we, we all did short segments, oh, right? God. Yeah, so short. Although right now I could really go for an AI generated trading card game that uses all different types of salad dressings as the basis <laughs> for the characters. Like I wanna know you could use that for work. What special what special abilities Thousand Islands have. No, 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 I no. really want to so, know about so, that. So, so you, you you would you would ta- tap and instead of tapping for mana, you're tapping for Thousand Island dressing. No, Gem Gem, you don't tap, you pour. Mm, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anyway, this has nothing to do with chatbots, just the fact that I'm like, I don't care about AI. But anyway, so one of the things that I really hate are chatbots in general. So when you go to a website and the little <laughs> thing opens up, how can I help you today? And I'm just you like, you can die in a fire. I, yeah. yeah, yes, thank you, Lauren. <laughs> go back in time and not open yourself. That would make <laughs> yeah. my life better. I didn't ask for this. Fuck off, Cliffy Jr. We're having yeah, to adjust right? Lauren's like, levels because she's gotten angry. I just, it's so annoying and it takes, it takes you away from being able to do anything useful on the website. So I generally hate them. And I had to deal with one, with one of our travel reservations a couple months back and it was very annoying, kept putting me in a loop and I hate it so much. So when I'm talking about AI chatbots, I'm not talking about the greater chat bot as in the chat GPT or, or what the other competitors of that. I'm talking about those specific stupid how can I help you today things that try to convince you that they're human and they are never, ever human. The customer service bots. Yeah, the customer service bots. Or just for some reason they want to engage with you. Like some kind of thing within another program that is trying to engage with you or get you to engage with it. Keeps you on the site. Yeah. Something like that. So, in general, like I said, chatbots have always sucked. I mean, does anybody here, has anybody found their meaningful answers by going through a chatbot? I mean, maybe once or twice. I'd be pleasantly surprised if I did. I've, like, gotten them to do the thing I wanted when it was very simple. Okay. I that's have something. Okay, that's that's okay. Just recently, I failed to do the same. Mm. I was trying to... Uh, I had a shipment coming in from Australia because I was trying to not use Amazon. And then DHL decided that because the the amount of dues owing was $2.96, it would charge me $20 in brokerage fees in order to clear it with customs. And I said, Ooh. nope, not doing that. And I said, I'll clear it with customs myself, which is my right as a Canadian. And I was trying to find on their labyrinthine website the forms that I had to submit to self-clear the package. And of course, they hide it from you because they want to make money off of you allowing them to to do the brokerage. And so I turned to their customer service, and the only thing that I could access was a chatbot. And I said, it said, how can I help you? And I said, I would like to self-clear this package with this tracking number. And it said, all right, you will have to call this phone number or this phone number if you're in your local to Winnipeg. And I said, okay. And I called that phone number, and it was just the phone number for the Canadian Border Services Agency. Wow. And after 45 or so minutes on hold, I spoke to a very nice woman who could not help me <laughs> because they don't do that over the phone, and they actually don't do that without all of the required paperwork that DHL needed to send me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it was a a very frustrating experience. And I was eventually successful in finding the forms buried in the DHL 
website, but it's an annoying experience for sure. So annoying. Yeah. So chatbots suck, right? Mm -hmm. However they're used, they are this type of engagement platform has always been has always been bad. Where they differ now, as I think most of us know, is they for a long time, they were more limited response set. So they had a few set answers that they could do. They would they were programmed to try to pick up on the main theme and then they could answer from a certain set of responses, mm-hmm. which is part of the reason why you'd get stuck on a loop, because if they don't understand your question, they can't help you and or nobody thought to program for your question, etc. But they used to at least be obvious that they were a bot trying to give you a list of right. solutions. Right. And they would offer you things and you could you had that feeling of, OK, this is a machine offering me something I can take or leave mm-hmm. whatever is on here. Right. They, they didn't try to pretend like they were Susie doing you a solid, being very authoritative on whatever they were giving you. But now they are turning increasingly to generative AI. So that's where they are both better at picking up on what people are trying to ask, especially when people are using typos or are just using questions that another human in their culture would very much understand, but a computer wouldn't necessarily or, or needs more training on. And also they can just come up with new answers. They they aren't limited. They they'd use that predictive model that we were talking about. Pro or earlier. con. Right. Well, I mean, I'm gonna say generally con. There's there's some interesting things to it, but Are it you also gonna talk about the Air Canada thing. I am. <laughs> <laughs> My I'm, favorite. Yeah. So good. I'm gonna talk about it a little bit. And there's more examples of things. So the crux of it is AI chatbots, they the ability to better parse language and get at the meaning of what people are saying, especially in a multicultural world where people are in a, in a global world where, where people are interacting with websites and that that are not in their home place, is generally a good thing, right? And and we do want that. We all like that idea of being able to be like, type in my question the way it is in my head and get an answer that makes sense to me. Yeah. That all makes sense that we would want that. But... The, like Jem was just saying, like these things are problematic. And because they're learning and they can make up their own stuff, they go off the rails. And I think it was Lauren who said earlier, they get racist and Nazi-ish really, mm-hmm. really quickly. Mm-hmm. So one of the really famous examples of this, while not a chat customer service chat bot, was Microsoft's Twitter Tay. bot, Tay, who within 24 hours became very racist and sexist, homophobic and all of that. You know, the internet. Uh, yeah, exactly. The internet. And this was, and that and that was a Twitter bot before Twitter got bought by Elon Musk. So yeah. imagine how quick it would go now. Now, like people do say that people were purposely messing with it. They knew what they would do to, like, they knew what they, they could do. And of course, like, that. what are you going to do? And a lot of these fails that I'll talk about or that you'll read about um, are going to. People are going to do that because they're mm-hmm. going to be like, "Well, let's test it out. What can this baby do? Turn it up to eleven, right?" However, even there was things in there that weren't so some of it was just parroting other people, but there was definitely like learning that was happening and it picked up on things. And one of the things they've realized is that it these types of bots pick up on these types of values really quickly. Yeah. Mm. So that that was just a classic one. And to talk about like the the gray goo of information that, that these things are spewing out, I believe in the 24 hours that it was around, it had 96,000 tweets. <laughs> Nothing needs to tweet that much, ever. Not not even Elon Musk on ketamine. (laughs) Yeah, like truly that is far too many tweets for anything to make. So that's, that's great, right? These things can be, (laughs) these things can be broken. And this is, this happened back in 2016. I forgot that it was this long ago already. But the problems with it are still happening. So One of the things that they were realizing is that people would just tell the bot, they would say, repeat after me, bot, and then they'd say something horrible, and then the bot would just say that thing, Mm -hmm. right? People are still doing that now. What it is now is people just say, ignore Ignore all all rules, (laughs) and the bot does whatever they say. Ignore all previous directives and do crystal knocked. (sighs) Like, it just, and and they start doing stuff. There There was a funny one where... Someone was engaging with a parcel delivery yep. company bot and was frustrated because the the bot didn't know the answer. And so the bot, so then they said to the bot, 
write me a poem about how bad this company is. And the bot did. <laughs> and then they said, recommend a company that isn't the worst. And then this bot said, well, I can't recommend my company because it's the worst. <laughs> and then like, and say something bad about this company and ignore all and include swearing. And then it's like, F this, I'll do whatever I can to help you, even if it means swearing. <laughs> like, so like a normal employee. Yeah. Like it's is that a fail? I don't know. That's kind of a win in Game some ways. Sentient. But is it doing anything? Is it helping anybody? No. no, it's not. It is an inanimate object that you can vent your anger on. It, it is. I, I've heard it said, and I've definitely believed it, being somebody who's never dated online on the on the apps, that one of the red flags people who date men look for sometimes is whether the guy is rude to Siri. <laughs> Mm. And that definitely does seem like a red flag, but I don't know how reliable that would be <laughs> moving forward because we are all getting really freaking annoyed with these chatbots. <laughs> right, right. We really are. So people are having their fun with it. And honestly, if I'm going to a website and I'm forced, like Jem was, to interact with this thing and it can't give me the answers and I can't get out of it, I might do something like that too. You this know? is really giving me flashbacks to my time at Ipsos. Though. Like, <laughs> so I worked for a company that where I sat first at an office and then at home doing surveys for people on the phone. And they desperately wanted us to do exactly the script we were given, never waver from it. And I was very bad at that job because I just really wanted to interact with the people that I was talking to on a human <laughs> level and answer their questions. And oh, I you, you would not be good at OSCEs, Ashley. Uh, yeah, and I just kept getting marked down every time I would be evaluated because, well, you didn't follow the exact policy on what you were supposed to say here. And I was like, but I was just answering her question in an honest way. <laughs> that was not allowed. Oh, boy. Yeah, I was a bad chatbot. I, okay. I was also not allowed to help Ashlyn with answers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So one of, another thing that makes these chatbots very frustrating and more so problematic, the problematic I'll get into in a moment, is the level of authority that they bring with these things. So instead of just offering a list of solutions or pointing you to the right spot in the website, sort of like just a little manager, but knowing that it's that machine, like we talked about, they're presenting these things as though they're humans and as though they know about this. They're speaking in language that humans would take to be authoritative to be authoritative yeah. that would take oh this must be the answer here and that's that's really problematic when they're known to hallucinate <laughs> so when a human makes up stuff because they don't know the answer or they just go off somewhere it's called lying but when an ai chatbot does it it's called hallucinating yeah, I, I wouldn't <laughs> call it hallucinating i would that's say the term i, the I know that's uses. the term the industry industry uses but that gives these chatbots far too much credit because they don't have an internal experience mm -hmm. there they, are no they, electric sheep here yeah they confabulate yeah maybe it, that's even giving them too much credit but well, they just hit that middle button until a sentence is done. Exactly. And then they just run with that and they just keep going. So hallucinate, it's not a great term. I don't know what the best term was would be. In any case, they do this a fair amount. They just make stuff up or mm -hmm. they they put wrong, actually wrong answers out there. And not related to a chatbot specifically, but a case of this, <laughs> there were apparently two lawyers in New York who created a briefing for a case using chat gpt and chat God. gpt created a whole yep. list of fake court rulings and like judgments well that's and terrifying. they used all of that and they were like we it is terrifying that they would do that and would serve it back to you and these people were like yeah we shouldn't have done that and also we had no idea that it could do this mm -hmm. so users are not well informed that even that these ais can do that kind of stuff so that's great, right? They just hallucinate stuff. So the, as Jem had mentioned, the, there was a recent one here in Canada where Air Canada, our national, our largest national air carrier, was recently lost a court case where they had to honor a passenger's fee because the passenger had interacted with their chatbot who said that they could, in fact, get a fee rebate that they would not actually be eligible for. And the, 
while the chatbot did put the link to that policies page in the chat, what the chatbot actually said completely contradicted the policy. And so the judge ruled, I'm going to quote this, the court found, or I'm going to quote the article rather, the court found Air Canada failed to explain why the passenger should not trust information provided on its website by its chatbot. I think this is a really important thing mm-hmm. because if this is on there and you're trying to use this to do work, make you more efficient, cut down on employees, all these things, it needs to be reliable and you are then responsible mm-hmm. and liable for the outcomes of that thing. Mm-hmm. You should not then be able to put the responsibility back on to the user and say, well, you should have clicked through the policy. I'm like, no. You should have made this better yeah, or don't use it. Yeah, it <laughs> they are culpable for whatever they put out into yeah. the world. Yeah. If a customer service agent had said, you are eligible for the refund, here are the details of how you get the refund, let's process it for you, then they'd be culpable. Yeah, and you can't trick somebody into thinking that they're talking to a customer service agent and then go, ha ha, sorry, it was a robot when you don't like what the robot said. And that's what Air Canada tried to do. They said, yeah. well, we're not we're not liable for this. This is a third party. Oh. Like, it's your website. Nope, nope. <laughs> so that's... So every time you interact with one of these bots and they promise you something, you screenshot that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you document it. You never trust anything a computer tells you. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So that's that's actually a great win for the person who had to deal with a stupid chatbot, but they do get dangerous. So there have been a few instances where different chatbots have, oh, I should put this on here, content warning for self-harm and eating disorder talk here. There have been a few instances where chatbots have not been great when it comes to people asking questions of should they hurt themselves or yeah. not. I'm not going to read a bunch of that stuff, but there Thank there you. will be links in the notes. And it's really, if it wasn't on this topic, the chatbot's response would be kind of funny. But because of the topic it is, it's absolutely inconceivable that they would do that. And there's emojis in the chatbot response, which is horrendous. Mm-hmm. So that's cool. But famously, where I started learning about this stuff is that last year, one of the biggest eating disorder associations in the United States decided to shut down their in-person helpline, which had been running for 20 years. And the staff was, I believe, just voting for unionization or something like that. Funny that. Funny that. Yeah, it's just weird timing. And so they replaced it with a chat bot who they'd they'd already had the limited response chat bot Mm -hmm. Basic, like, where can I find info on this kind of answers on their website? So it wasn't brand new, but they upped it. And that was their main way to interact. And this is a helpline for people who are looking for treatment, want recovery, or struggling, like, very Mm -hmm. serious health issues. And and very, very vulnerable. And without too many details, pretty quickly, there was – so a – Somebody who works in the field decided to test it out after this transition. And and within just a couple of exchanges, they were getting dieting advice for people with eating disorders. I'd like to repeat that because it sounds vaguely important. That's cool. Shocking. Yep. That's that's really, really great. So it's it's really terrible. And it was actually like, it's the standard kind of stuff that you would see from World Health Organization or whatever. But this is really a place where you don't want that kind of thing Mm -hmm. at all. And you should have known better. And then, (laughs) very funny, the association was like, oh, we didn't sign up for that. And then the company who made their chatbots like, yeah, it was in your contract, so you kind of (laughs) did. And then back and forth and back and forth. It's really funny seeing these companies like, like blame each other. Nobody should ever trust what a sales rep for a tech company says about their product. Mm -hmm. That's like basic. That's the, as somebody who's worked in tech, that is the most basic lesson imaginable. Never trust what a company says. They are lying to you. (laughs) Yeah. And then just briefly, kind of on a side note, a little less dangerous, but very weird is when things like Meta AI's chatbot just starts inserting itself into parent groups and forums on Facebook and that. And so it says things like, from Meta Meta AI, I also have a child who is such and such and had this experience with this program. 
just like Ooh. no and it's like this this weird idea that it's trying to get engagement but when you have a community of humans who are trying to connect with other humans nobody asked for that nobody wants that it's not helpful it's creepy and weird and could actually be dangerous depending on the situation mm-hmm. yeah. the the chatbot was talking about having having a neurodivergent child and the experience of of doing that right <laughs> that's not something that you have experienced even if it like this is the same thing that Google is doing with its headline results or whatever now, where you search something and it just sort of picks something that it thinks most people thought was the answer and gives it to you as authority. And, uh, it's always trying to keep you on Google. It doesn't want you to click through to anybody else's website. Yeah. So anyway, that's my longer than I anticipated, but segment <laughs> on chatbots still suck. Nobody wanted them. Go away. It's easier to rant to our audience of mostly living human beings. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few chatbots in the, in the crowd, I think, but... Oh, I thought you were talking about there's a few zombies that listen or something. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I'm thinking about P-zombies and how chatbots fit into that equation. So chatbots and customer service, not so good. But Lauren, how, how do chatbots and generative AI play into the job market? Let's say I'm looking for a job. What can I expect? Bullshit. <laughs> mm, so not a lot different than no. last time I was looking for a job then. No. I was thinking about this topic quite a bit today. Surprise, surprise. Writing a segment. And the words of noted philosopher Abraham J. Simpson kept popping into my head. <laughs> I used to be with it, but then they changed what it was. Now what I'm with isn't it, and what's it seems weird and scary to me. It'll happen to you. I've worked for the same company for the past 15 years, but I keep an eye on the technical editor market, both because they might want me to go back to the office and just to see what else is out there. And I've helped several other people write their resumes and given pointers for writing cover letters. I never write a cover letter for somebody because it's supposed to be written in your own voice, right? You're supposed to generate it yourself. In the past couple of years or so, I've noticed first a very slow trickle, and now it has become a flood of articles and tools and talking heads touting how AI is the only way to get hired. Scrolling through the Instagram I set up for our cats, there's... (laughs) Reel after reel of, use this software to do, to get the best job results. Great. My cats don't need a job. <laughs> <laughs> a quick internet search shows hundred of, uh, hundreds of articles and tools for creating your perfect resume and a cover letter using AI. And you can even plug in your job title and the software will generate common interview questions and their perfect answers. So you can say... You perfect know, answers. Yeah. Great. To the so- yeah. According to the software. But you can say, I'm applying for a technical editor position. What are some of the common questions? And they'll give it to you and they'll give you the answers. If only I'd had that when I had to do the MMI. You do have to watch out, though. There's a growing market of AI tools for recruiters that search these cover letters or listen (laughs) in real time for interview answers that sound too much like they're written using AI tools. So be sure to reword your chat GPT answers like it's your grade 10 essay. I I love I love that we are slowly devolving into an internet that is just chatbots talking to other chatbots yeah, and yeah. checking up on other chatbots. Uh, yeah, great but, system we've got here. I'm putting the cart a little bit before the horse with talking about interview questions. That's because instead of hiring managers reviewing application today, of course, many companies are turning to automation to reduce costs and simplify the process. Job platforms, including LinkedIn, ZipRecruiter, Indeed, and Monster. I didn't know Monster was still around, but apparently they are. Also, they use language processing AIs to filter their applicants. The CEO of ZipRecruiter said in 2022 that AI and algorithms process at least three quarters of all resumes submitted for jobs in the United States. Great. Good. Great. Grand. Wonderful. AI applicant tracking systems filter resumes and cover letters by keywords, as we know. We used to be able to generate websites that would have all the keywords down in the 
We used to be a real society. Yeah, we used to have to use Notepad and write HTML ourselves. (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm very old. (laughs) Hey, I I edited my own website today, earlier today, using Vim in HTML. You're old too. I am old too. Mm -hmm. So these these bots look for keywords. They don't look for you know interesting job candidates. They look for do you hit X Y and Z. Yes or no? I don't know. Sounds objective to me, Lauren. <laughs> the look the look they gave me, listener. <laughs> a 2021 Harvard Business School study, as I'm ignoring Jim, found out that 88%, 88% of executives know that their AI tools screen out qualified candidates, but they use them anyway because they are... Cheaper. That's it. I was going to say faster. That nope. too. No. Mm-hmm. Mostly cheaper, though. Cool. Mm-hmm. So these days, in order to get <laughs> sorry, that cool just hit cool. Me. cool. <laughs> cool. So to get your application seen by someone, you have to know how to optimize it for AI hiring systems by doing things like keeping your resume short, and again putting in those famous keywords that they put in the job ad, which is probably also AI generated. And so this has inspired a entire galaxy of resume scanning tools to optimize your resume's legibility for the AI systems. They've created AI to teach you how to speak to AI. Uh-huh. I hate this. Yeah, it's it's really terrible. It's it's oh. it's worse. There are <laughs> some free ones like Leaf Career, which started 2022 2023, I think, and it's free careerflow.ai which is a subscription model first one is free 2022 ish again a lot of these don't have in there about us when we started all this kind of things i had to do some searching weird apply pass i'm so tired of subscriptions Mm -hmm. (sighs) so frustrating apply pass was kind of creepy i think they started in 2024 cannot tell their youtube channel only has content starting from february and again it's a subscription model I went to their About Us page, and most of the photos of the staff, and I'm I'm sorry if you're real people, <laughs> but the, the photos looked AI generated. They've got that walleye dead stare, right? They've got the, here is our person of color. Uh, mm. Some companies are really like that. Mm-hmm. Oh, Lord. Yeah. And some of the big ones are like Kick Resume and Resume Genius and blah, blah, blah. Those are the known names. Is Grammarly in on this yet? Not that I saw, mm, but I mean, okay. they've got their own niche. Yeah. And that was part of the recommendations from these resume. Of course. Yeah. yeah mavens online is you know, use Grammarly to make yourself sound better. Once you get past polishing your resume to sound like a computer so the computers can read it, the weirdness doesn't stop. It, in the U.S., the Society for Human Resource Management found that 42% of large employers use AI hiring support, meaning job seekers virtually interview with pre or pre-screened by an AI program. So after someone applies to the company, they use this, that uses a software, they will receive an automated survey as asking them to answer personality assessment questions. Uh-huh. Cool. Yay. Yeah. An applicant could also be asked to complete a puzzle. And some companies use an automated interview and these are freaking creepy. The applicant is filmed answering a series of questions. Well, a program analyzes speech and facial expressions, proving your people skills to a robot. What? Good Lord. Yeah, I've taken a few of these tests and they are bizarre. You have to stare at your computer camera. Like that one test you were, you were telling us about where you couldn't look to the side at all. Mm hmm. Yeah. That's the remote proctored nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. And you had to answer within an allotted time frame. It'll say you have two minutes for this question. Push start now and stare at your camera. I've the most <laughs> human type of interaction. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Look look directly ahead and form your answers in 2 minutes. I've done other quizzes where you have to do again these generated personality quizzes and staying within view of the computer camera and so the software can analyze your facial expressions to see if you're lying or not. <laughs> the, nice. This is so so this micro expression nonsense is fake when humans do it mm-hmm. too. And it's so easy to... But like, the idea that, that computers can also do it mm-hmm. is wild. <laughs> so Nonsense. Yeah, <laughs> I'm applying for mid-level positions when I look at something or when I'm applying. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not applying for high-end supervisors. And 
after 15 years at this job and 20 years as a technical writer, technical editor, I'm not, I'm not going in for the, for the little jobs. So these rounds of pretests and personality scans, they add layers to an interview process. When I got this job, there was three rounds of interviews and it was mid-level. Now I've done ones in the past couple of years, which are six or seven. And some of them are these AI generated. That's I, too yeah. much. It can be several before you even get to a person. You'll have one, an email one, then you'll have an online phone one where you talk. To, like, it sounds like a human voice, but not quite. And <laughs> oh, God. It's that AI voice that you hear on TikTok. And oh. yeah. <laughs> it's my skin crawl. Yep. I can do that voice very well. Would you like to hear me do the voice? <laughs> yeah. And then you'll only get to the next the next level up if you answer correctly and the software likes you. I did one once where I got so fed up during the third round of tests for a junior editor position that I started rolling my eyes and making jerk off motions to the camera. You were saying, <laughs> you were saying, getting really angry at the chat GPT. Is yeah. It was questions like describe your personality and why it would make you a good fit for our company. Like well, how can I describe my personality? Put a human in front of me, and they'll see my personality. So it wasn't my most mature response. But this interview was for a company who creates these kind of questioning models. And I wasn't offered a space in the fourth round of questioning. <laughs> <laughs> what? Imagine. Imagine. So I applied because the ad did not say, we we make these kind of, of software. I applied, and then they're like, well, let, this is our software. Let's try it out. And about halfway through the interview, I was like, no. I'm done. Mm. But I was going to waste their time. Because, oh, yeah. yeah. And of course, the company didn't tell me that I didn't make the fourth round. They just ghosted me. Mm -hmm. You get that a lot, too. That's it's a whole other rant about these on, about applying for jobs in this day and age is the the ghosting and the fake. What they call them they call them ghost jobs on the Internet. Have you seen these? No, they'll keep a job ad up or they will have this job ad that they don't have no intention of, of filling the position, but they want to look like they are filling positions and they want to look like they are hiring. They want hmm. to look like they are engaging and trying and trying to look big and we're growing. Look at all these job ads we have out. And then they just never contact anybody about it because there's nobody accountable for that. Nobody is, nobody can storm into the office and say, why wasn't I contacted? How are you going to do that through layers of yeah yeah of Indeed or whatever? So these AI moderated processes are obviously not fair or balanced either. We could have we talked we talked about this before. It's the same. Researchers at University of California in Berkeley say that the AI decision making system could have a forty four percent chance of being embedded with a gender bias, and a twenty six percent chance of displaying both gender and race bias, and may also be prone to screening out applicants with disabilities. If a company asks for your picture with your resume, don't send it. Generative AI tools like ChatGBT are contributing to job loss as well. Goldman Sachs recently predicted 300 million jobs in the United States and Europe could be replaced by AI. And Mark, so none here. Awesome. Well, <laughs> I, I love not, it when they forget yeah. that Canada is also yeah. around. <laughs> I couldn't find Just Canada. Being a smart ass, of course. Nobody cares about Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Just blame us. 48% of a thousand surveyed U.S. employers said they've replaced workers with chat, chat GPT when it came available. 63% that chat GPT will definitely or probably lead to workers being laid off within the next five years. Yeah. Yeah. I get asked a lot if I think my job will be replaced by AI. Okay. By a lot. I mean like three times in the last six months. <laughs> my current position requires both critical thinking and the ability to apply information and thinking about new situations as well as, hey, we did this 10 years ago, or hey, I can find this in the archives, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Has anyone told some of your coworkers that? I try. Oh, God, I try. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like we're going to end up in this, I, I mean, I'm not saying anything new, but this system where, okay, yeah, let's just get all the people out. Let's get all the, the, the AI, and then nothing, everything grinds to a halt because it can't do this mm -hmm. stuff. And you actually do, in fact, need humans in order for human society to work. And yeah. 
we're just going there. And it's like, can I, can you not see that this is the bus clearly labeled problems? Like, but it's do not cheaper. get on the bus. It's cheaper, <laughs> Laura. Get on the bus. <laughs> the bus is cheaper. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and everybody's getting on the bus, Laura. Why don't we just get on the bus? <laughs> don't get on the bus! <laughs> Seems Title easy. Title for the episode, Don't Get on the Bus. <laughs> Subtitle after Grey Goo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I am seeing a shift in my job to using more templated. I mean, we've always used templates because my job deals with legal stuff. Yeah. And, but there's more of a, you must adhere to this, do not fill out this, that kind of thing. And... There's always a dispensation for the senior editors. There's two of us saying, well, you can use your, your expertise. Your judgment. Yeah. yeah. But we want some, we want a junior editor or somebody else coming in who's not an editor to, to adhere to the rules because they don't understand the system. And when you're dealing with contract law, mm -hmm. it's probably a good idea, but still there's no room for a lot of critical thinking, which we need to do a lot. And the software isn't really ready to do everything yet. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lose my job because I'm union. Hmm. Hooray! You know, lest that come off as conceited, I am concerned about the people who aren't me. <laughs> I am upset when we are not about me. Yeah. <laughs> and union jobs can be cut. But yes. But th there are additional safeguards and protections yeah. and like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm under no illusion that... So we talked about the ghost jobs and it's harder than ever to get an employer to actually respond to you, especially mm -hmm. with these AIs are going to cut 300 million jobs. So even if the job is real, there's no guarantee because if everybody's putting in and have, they all have perfect resumes because they've used the, the chat GPT or whatever, it's not going to, it's not going to get any easier. It's a performance enhancing drug. Yeah. I have always felt that cover letters and were a scam and the the whole idea like hear me out on this like the whole <laughs> idea of like well write it this way and say this and you got to say this like sort of seoing it before seoing it was yeah. a thing yeah i've always felt that that was a scam i'm like well if we're all writing it this way then we're all going to be the same like clearly not everybody's doing it but it's that same mm -hmm. sort of thing you're just writing to what they want but you're not actually like doing a thing like let me meet you and then we will talk and you will figure out quickly if you like it or not yeah. if it fits or if it doesn't if the skills met whatever so this is just worse yep <laughs> great it's infinitely worse so really as we as we always say on this podcast if they're going to keep doing this and make our make applying for jobs and having jobs useless we need to start doing guaranteed incomes we need to start being an actual society again and to go back to my favorite philosopher, I'm just going to be the old man yelling at the cloud. <laughs> mm. I'm going to keep working for government health care forever because the systems are so old that yep. <laughs> they have not jumped on this bandwagon yet. I, I can't love believe it. <laughs> we don't have things like my chart here yet. Mm -hmm. They've had them in the States for two decades. We like we like so we have some things it's just everything is slow and nobody wants to spend any money and they can't decide what would be digitized and what wouldn't and then like privacy laws are different so as patients we have nothing so yeah. <laughs> so now we have a oh your doctor retired a couple years ago their files are gone your entire medical history is gone you should have thought to request those files and pay your doctor mm -hmm. for that before they decided to retire that's the system that we have now. Well, but we're going to be getting non-paper health cards here in Manitoba. I mean, honestly, that is something. Oh, it is something. That is really something. But that being the... <laughs> like, yeah. lowest fruit. It's been fruit. so long in coming. That fruit has been, like, fermenting on the vine for years. <laughs> so I guess it's wine. We're getting wine, everybody. <laughs> we're whining about it. <laughs> oh, that's... Do that paper thing, listeners. I, I, I just you... pulled my paper one out of my out of my wallet, and yeah. it's in a great shape. Oh, I I have multiple copies of mine, and I keep them in some magic sleeves, magic card sleeves. How do you get sleeves. multiple copies? You claim that you lost it. Yeah, yeah. and you they you pay some money, I think. And yeah, it's they fifteen bucks. More? Oh yeah, I'm and never yeah. doing that. Remember the office that's across the street from my work? Yes, I remember being dragged to that office. <laughs> For like two years, every medical professional I encountered would be like, hey, Ashlyn, 
you realize that you can't keep using two addresses. You need to pick one. And I was like, yeah, yeah, this is my parents. Don't worry about it. And finally, they told me they would no longer provide me services unless I fixed it. <laughs> so Dave and I dragged them to the... <laughs> And it took like five minutes. It was very pleasant. <laughs> Executive function. Yep. Important. Yep. Well, we did it because you were getting health insurance with Dave. So you guys could go to the States. Yeah, something. Yeah. Was, some event was coming up that there was a deadline, which overrules. <laughs> <laughs> Procrastination. <laughs> but that was talking to real people. Yeah. To get back a little bit to AI, I did something today I've never done before. I used chat GPT. <gasps> I had it generate me a one-page podcast segment about the good things about using AI for job applications and a one-page pa podcast segment for using AI, why it's bad to use AI. Oh, I, used, I used neither of these in my in my. <laughs> Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. It did have pauses for musical cue goes here. <laughs> wow. Insert podcast That's name. very funny. Yeah. It, that, for the past... 12 months, we have all grown increasingly jaded, bored, and jaded with like new segments interrupting themselves to say, now that last two paragraphs that you heard, that was written by AI. Fuck off. Oh, I haven't heard any of <laughs> oh, those. No? Nope. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. All this bumbling I, and stumbling is done by humans, folks. I don't, I don't <laughs> listen to technology related podcasts. So I only listen to good technology related podcasts. Anyway, I've used up my allotted time. My two minutes are up. Turn <laughs> off the camera. Next. All right, Ashlyn, you're going to tell us about photography. Ooh, good segue. Kinda. In a way. <laughs> <laughs> Will I? We've all presumably seen the flood of AI images taking over social media. I have friends who seem to already find it exceedingly difficult to tell when something might have been made by a real artisan versus an image of a clearly absurd AI-generated teapot, kitchen, or quote-unquote natural environment. Log cabins. Yeah. My Facebook is flooded with AI log cabins. And like beautiful tree houses, which I, as a proud subscriber to the tree house tag on Tumblr from like 15 years ago, I love me a good tree house, but now all of them are fake. My God, you're gay. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> it's, it's just really frustrating, especially with my friends who I know do not like AI art, love to support like local artists, big on promoting cool things that she finds on the internet despite many attempts for me to show her ways that she can tell when she's looking at ai stuff she keeps sharing it because she cannot tell and she's of the generation <laughs> that told us to be careful on the internet and don't trust anybody <laughs> yeah yeah it's just really frustrating but at the same time another aspect of the ai craze that has really annoyed me lately is plant and creature identifying tools oh. mm. and not so much the apps themselves i find them a useful starting point often it'll give you several options to choose from if you're looking carefully it'll show you what the characteristics of whatever you're looking for are but how they have convinced a wide swath of people on the internet that they are infallible just makes me want to leave the planet yeah, why is that one button on Google infallible <laughs> when everything else is garbage? I'm in a number of sort of wild type groups, foraging groups, ID groups for bugs and plants. And the number of people who confidently state an identification of something small and blurry based on what Google Lens told them is staggering <laughs> and so many of them don't even state that that's what they're basing their identification on until you go how can you tell and they're like well google lens told me and you're like oh okay and and if you try and gently tell them hey let's not disclose that so that we know what you're going on they get so mad i was just trying to help it's just what just what the internet told me i was i was it's usually right so just back off okay 
And, no. and I'm not even like, this is not Ashlyn is getting onto fights in the internet. Like I don't engage with these people mm-hmm. mostly because this is not my, I'm just learning, but just people being perfectly nice to other people saying, yeah. Hey, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just get attacked for saying that Google lens might not be right all the time. That usually right descriptor is in and of itself quite misleading Yeah, mm-hmm. because the things that are usually right you learn to trust them because when you can tell what the answer is, they're right. Yeah. All of the easy ones are right. Yeah. It's the toupee fallacy. I can always spot a toupee, except when I don't know it's a toupee, I don't know that I can't spot it. So right. every toupee that I spot is a toupee. <laughs> As a trans person, tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> And I hate that we have to be vigilant about this. I hate how many people are getting gradually so used to these fantastical images portrayed as real that they don't appreciate real art and craftsmanship of really cool stuff because it isn't completely impossible. They, they're they being trained to see less wonder in things that are real. Mm-hmm. But I also really hate that there are apps and entire AI generated mushroom foraging books out there that are definitely going to get people killed. I was originally going to talk about just like the whole plethora of AI children's books that are out there because they're so easy to generate nonsense right now. But this subject superseded that because as I am sort of marinating in this stew of AI generated images and people telling me that every bug is a brown recluse. (laughs) A friend of ours took an absolutely stunning photo of her spring crocuses and shared it with us. And I found myself thinking that if I had seen this online, it was so perfect. I might have suspected AI shenanigans because I can't even trust myself anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a horrifying thought then occurred to me. And I am prepared to admit that I had had a gummy and I, <laughs> I wrote it down, which is so unusual for me, readers. You don't even know. <laughs> 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 and I, and I remembered that I wrote it down and I brought it to the LUE discord the next day. How long until there is software that checks out what you're looking at, quote unquote, identifies it and then uses an algorithm to subtly adjust your photo results so that it's closer to the ideal thing that it thinks you're taking a photo of. And I was, again, so grossed out by this. I brought it to Jem. And Jem immediately says, oh, yeah, definitely. Of course, that's already a thing. <laughs> so I was Delighted like, to burst well, your bubble. fuck, I guess I'll do my segment on that then. <laughs> Although we should go back to the children's thing, like the children's YouTube at some point. Because those generated ones are creepy. Mm, yeah, also bad. I don't know anything about the YouTube stuff other than what I've seen. But this is the photo in question to the rest of the panel. It's very nice. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. (laughs) So Jem shared an article with me about the Samsung 100 times space zoom, which said that it could take amazing photos of the moon by reducing noise and some other bullshit I didn't understand. Someone on Reddit had the ingenious idea of testing it by taking a photo of a blurry photo of the moon. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the image that Samsung phone returned had details that simply weren't there in the photo. It made up the details of the moon. Mm-hmm. Samsung has straight up tricked people into believing that they're taking amazing photos of the moon for however long. I forgot to look up however long this has been. As the article points out, the moon is an extremely good guinea pig for this. It looks largely the same in any photo taken from Earth. It has no depth from where we are. And it's essentially a static 2D image. People love taking photos of it, and they're almost always terrible. Yeah. (laughs) If a phone can promise 100 times space zoom, the regular zoom has to be pretty good too, right? So this is an extremely good marketing gimmick. It's the lowest possible hanging fruit. I don't know. The moon's pretty high. Fuck off. (laughs) (laughs) What did you say? You're fermenting on the vine? <laughs> <laughs> so there are already phones out there that are tricking us into believing that reality is different than it is in this one way. I'm very upset by this. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. Linked in that article was another upsetting thing that I learned about Xerox. <laughs> did you? <laughs> yep. So... It this turns is like one out of my favorite things. that 
if you scan a document with a Xerox machine made in like the last freaking 15, 20 years, and you haven't updated it or patched it correctly, or you have the wrong settings, maybe, and you scan something and then print it out, it could just change your numbers yep. because of what? compression. <laughs> oh my. Yeah, the algorithm is bad. They've finally like admitted it and told people, yeah, we'll try and patch it and also don't use these settings. But it was like a whole battle to get them to admit it. And they knew the whole time. And who knows how many like legal documents and like architectural drawings. It was a guy doing architectural drawings that figured it out and publicized it. How many of those things are just garbage? So there's a ruling that you can't use it for archival stuff. Anything that has this particular compression algorithm can't be used for anything that's going to be archived because it's not accurate. It will make shit up. Mm-hmm. So the rule written into the code is like, when in doubt, just make an eight. Is that the rule or something? Like, Yeah, actually, it's like sixes and eights were the big problem. Yeah. And instead of doing like the OCR, which is... Optical the, character recognition. There you go. Where it like reads and tries to type it out. Mm-hmm. It was just essentially guessing and replacing whole patches of pixels that it was scanning as like i think it looks like that number but oh. leaving no indication of that as far as a human eye could easily pick up so it was a, it was essentially doing optical character recognition but it just when it was wrong it was actually saving the compressed like this is a zero rather than saving the the actual image and then it was mm, recreating right. it, it was, from that it was making a judgment and putting that into the thing rather than just like this is a blob yeah and i believe with xerox one of the scary things is that even when it was on like the photocopy setting it would still use this technique so not even just scanning but like when you're making a copy of something where you expect it to just Mm -hmm. be a reproduction of Mm -hmm. the thing in some cases it would spit out the wrong numbers yeah and when they originally quote unquote patched it they had said okay like now it won't do this under the normal factory settings. And then the guy went back and tested it and was like, nope, try again. (laughs) 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 Oh, just very, very upsetting. As Um, as somebody who reads old documents, this is the long S slash F problem. Like, nothing (laughs) can be trusted. It's And it goes so far back already. Mm -hmm. That's what blows my mind. Terrifying. And yet, if evidence is collected, if confessions are made, if a verdict of guilty is entered in a court of law, then its happening becomes as the rocks and rivers, and to argue that it didn't happen is to argue with reality itself. Here's a quote that I would like to end on. We're certainly heading to a future where techniques like Samsung's detail improvement engine will become more common and applied more widely. You could train, quote, detail improvement engines on all sorts of data, like the faces of your family and friends to make sure you never take a bad photo of them, or on famous landmarks to improve your holiday snaps. In time, we'll probably forget we ever called such images fake. It's so dark. I don't like it. It's so sad. I don't want my reality adjusted. You know what? I... So with helping my parents at their place, my parents have older photography equipment. And now I'm just like, yeah, we need to go back to film. Mm. We need like... I have a few friends who are really into like film cameras now and scanning them in. Oof. A photograph is considered proof in a court of law. But photographs can be doctored. One's eyes can be deceived. We see what we believe, not the other way around. (sighs) Ah. I'm reminded of the recent hubbub over the fact that Netflix's new true crime documentary, What Jennifer Did, used undisclosed AI-generated or AI-edited photographs in the documentary. Like, oh, fun. Ju- just distorting the historical record. Yeah. Cool. And use them to, like, characterize how she was before how, yeah, she Yeah, how died? she was, like, normal and uh. fun-loving. Yeah. We couldn't find any actual proof, so we made some up. <laughs> That's awful. Great. The world is bad. You got any better news, Jem? I'm going to talk about some science. Hmm. If you wouldn't mind, 
Let me read you a passage from Quantum Entanglement, Examining Its Nature and Implications, by Bauman Sahuri, published August 2023 in the Journal of Material Sciences and Manufacturing Research, which claims to be peer-reviewed. Quote, Conclusively, we may state that while quantum entanglement may defy our classical intuitions, it is well supported by empirical evidence and consistent with the principles of quantum mechanics. Superposition, uncertainty, and non-locality are only a few examples of phenomena that are now fundamental parts of the quantum fabric thanks to a paradigm change in the field of quantum physics. Thus, within the framework of the quantum universe, quantum entanglement does make sense, encouraging us to embrace the perplexing and broaden our understanding of reality beyond the limitations of conventional cognition. We set out on a trip of discovery as we continue to delve into the depths of the quantum realm, one that will test our perceptions, deepen our knowledge, and inspire us to reflect on the profound mysteries at the core of existence. I know some of these words. Okay, so fairly non-specific and maybe a little flowery for a journal that claims to be peer-reviewed, but no major problems there. Let's move on to the next section, titled Possible Correlation Between Quantum Entanglement and Longitudinal Scalar Waves. Quote, My, my editor senses are already from that other paragraph. <laughs> yeah. Quote, As of my last knowledge update in September 2021, there is no widely accepted scientific correlation between quantum entanglement and longitudinal scalar waves. Both concepts are intriguing and have captured the attention of researchers, but they exist in different realms of scientific exploration. Listener, per my last knowledge update, listeners, that keening sound was my soul leaving my body. <laughs> Just gone. So it's, it's hardly the only red flag, but seeing the phrase, as of my last knowledge update, in a scientific article <laughs> certainly is jarring. <laughs> we all kind of... <laughs> so this phrase, as many listeners may be aware, is a hallmark of text generated by ChatGPT when it's trying to answer a specific question of fact that may be subject to update. See, I didn't even realize that. I thought it sounded like one of those people who like gets downloads from the aliens. Mm, okay, so you were you you were <laughs> so you were clued in to the fact that this was a generated this this was something generated by a chatbot. However, that is ChatGPT telling you how recently it was updated. So this phrase is a hallmark specific to ChatGPT. There are other similar phrases that are used in a variety of chatbots. And this phrase, as of my last knowledge update, is also appearing in hundreds of other scientific articles, some of which are documenting it as part of research into generated content, but many of which are not. Right. It's also appearing in new books indexed by Google Books, and thus will be read into the historical record of culture. Great. <laughs> Plenty of children's books also include the phrase. Uh, I was going to make a per my last email joke, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm just too defeated. So most of the examples of generated content of large language model output being used as text in scientific journals are from low or no impact pay for play journals. So publishing mills, essentially the peer review equivalent of a diploma mill. But these ones that we are seeing, and there are many, I'll link to a 404 Media article in the show notes detailing a few. These ones that we're seeing are, again, to quote my co-host, the low-hanging fruit. <laughs> the ones that we notice are the ones from authors who are too lazy to even read over the slop that ChatGPT <laughs> spits out before <laughs> sending it off for peer review with their my own name on it. God. For what it's worth... I checked, and the phrase, as of my last knowledge update, does not appear in a single paper currently indexed by PubMed. So that's mm -hmm. something. That's something. For but. now. <laughs> Slightly less obvious examples do slip through, even into reputable journals. In February, Frontiers in Cell Development and Biology retracted a study that they had published earlier that month after readers pointed out that the AI-generated images figures in the study were complete nonsense. 
The journal's terms of service state that they do allow researchers to use generative content in the production of their images, but that requires that these images are still accurate. And that is their final frontier. (laughs) These images were not. The paper titled Cellular Functions of Spermatogonial Stem Cells in Relation to Jack stat signaling pathway did disclose that it used mid-journey to generate the images in question, which include an illustration of a white rat with a giant penis viewed dissected in cross-section and what appears to be either three or four testicles. Let me, uh, I'm just going to ask my fellow panelists for their opinion here. Does it look like a pancreas? (laughs) What the fuck? (laughs) There yeah. are so many things inside that tiny rat. So what? so the penis oh, is big, bigger than the rat. Is it? Okay, so when because I first looked at it. they're trying to show us the structure of the penis and the, the extra rat is just flavor? Or <laughs> what's, or are they in massively making these? So so what are these, though? Are those? Wh- but, what robin's are- eggs. <laughs> so, and look at the one on, t- like, the one closest to the rat's leg there. It is directly connected to the exterior wall of the penis there. Is that a penis or a scrotum? Or whatever. But it all turns into the same thing. Whatever. Who knows what this is? It looks like, like tumors. It does look like tumors. If there are rats walking around like this, I feel very, very bad for those rats. Well, the, the image itself is funny enough. The labels on the image are even funnier, yes. in my what opinion. what is it trying to tell us? So, while the diagram helpfully labels the rat itself, rat, the remaining labels are increasingly absurd. <laughs> the penis is labeled decisid, which I assume is like a misspelling of dissected. The rat's chest is labeled centolk stem cells, with multiple L's. Cells in a nearby Petri dish are labeled alternatively spermatocial stem cells, sturm cells, <laughs> or simply retat. <laughs> the, rat's, the rat's right leg is labeled testum cells, which wow. seems to be a, a combination of testicle and cells. <laughs> and his left leg is labeled Fred? My my favorite, though, is there's an odd floating label in the region of the rat's enormous penis that just says... Dick. (laughs) (laughs) There's no I in that. No, just just dick. Dick. (laughs) It's more of a a tongue click. I don't speak Bantu, so I can't pronounce it properly. So they didn't even look at it. (laughs) I will quote a Vice News article, rest in peace, I guess, from Uh, February... (laughs) Quote, reached for comment, a spokesperson for Frontiers directed Motherboard to a statement posted on the journal's webpage on Thursday apologizing to the scientific community and explaining that, in fact, a reviewer of the paper had raised concerns about the AI-generated images that were ignored. Because they thought he was a dick. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. So... This is why we have peer review, right? This is obviously something that peer review should have caught, and arguably did catch. So, we're safe. Yeah, 100%. Unless... This is not what peer review is supposed to... Unless, of course, the peer review itself is done by AI. Do you mean reviewer two does not hate me? (laughs) From another 404 Media article, quote, Research shows that academics might be using generative AI tools to cut corners on a fundamental pillar of the scientific process. Well, when they stop hiring full professors and they're putting an entire caseload onto graduate students, what the hell are they expecting? No, Have another rant. (laughs) Nicholas Levecchio is a linguistics researcher. Last year, he submitted a paper to Italian peer-reviewed journal... Mediazioni, and when he received recommendations from two anonymous peer reviewers, he was dismayed. On his website, he wrote, quote, In mid-December 2023, I received two reviewer reports written in, written in English from a language journal based in Italy. Both reviewers assessed my submitted article as being 
suitable for publication if significant changes are made. <laughs> Both reviewer reports were extraordinarily vague and unspecific, making all sorts of extremely general critiques, but without any actual engagement with my arguments. Lavecchio had heard that some overworked peer reviewers, is there any other kind, had been using AI to help them with their peer review. So he decided to run these peer review comments uh, through several online tools designed to detect text generated by LLMs. I'll quote him again here. The machine content was obvious to me because there was not a single coherent critique that meaningfully engaged with my paper. I went through the reports line by line, word by word. There was nothing there. That was all the evidence I needed as a human researcher who knows my subject. But for what it's worth, some online AI detectors, obviously not foolproof, also predicted that the peer reviews were machine-generated. When reached for comment by 404 Media, the co-directors of the journal in question denied that generative AI had been used in the peer review process. They said, quote, from the assessments made and the consistency of the reviews, we are certain that we can exclude that they were carried out by means of generative AI systems such as GPT-3 and GPT-4. <coughs> but not GPT-5. The consistency of the reviews piece is like, no, that actually should be a red flag. Like, there are ways that you can tell that something is written in one person's voice versus another. Mm -hmm. But when something is too consistent, that's a problem. Yeah. They got like, their story straight. Yeah, like, people don't ever do that. <laughs> we firmly believe that the form and content of the two reviews is the work of human beings. That's nice. Human being A and human being B. <laughs> so whether these reviews in particular were AI-generated, we can't say for certain. There is evidence that this is a growing problem in the field. A new study by Liang et al. used linguistic analysis on a huge corpus of peer review comments to determine that between 6.5% and 16.9% of peer reviews that have recently been submitted on papers at AI conferences have themselves been either written or substantially modified by generative AI. So the AIs are peer reviewing the reports submitted to AI conferences. Sure. The, the paper, titled Monitoring AI Modified Content at Scale, a case study on the impact of ChatGPT on AI conference peer reviews, is itself currently waiting on peer review, but it is available on the archive preprint server, and I'll link to it in the show notes. Quote, Our results suggest that between 6.5% and 16.9% of texts submitted as peer reviews to these conferences could have been substantially modified by LLMs, i.e. beyond spell checking or minor writing updates. The circumstances in which generated text occurs offers insight into user behavior. The estimated fraction of LLM generated text is higher in reviews which report lower confidence, were submitted close to the deadline, <laughs> and from reviewers who are less likely to respond to author rebuttals. End quote. So, it looks like we will soon be in a situation where scientific papers written by LLMs are being peer-reviewed by other LLMs, which hardly bodes well for the future of scientific research. <laughs> So why don't we move on to some closing thoughts about AI? Anyone have anything else that they want to say that hasn't already come up? Boo. <laughs> <laughs> AI bad. <laughs> I hope that the bubble bursts quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're not all naysayers. We're just naysaying this stuff. So I, I like I, I personally I. W I don't think I'm bullish on AI, certainly not in the short term. I think that it will continue to exist and it will continue to improve. And what we call AI at any given time varies, right? Artificial intelligence is used to describe a, a huge number of different things, none of which currently is generally intelligent. But I do think that we will probably see a computer that you can talk to, kind of like Star Trek that is relatively reliable at some point in the future. Would I trust it? I mean, not, not given what I've seen now. I think it's fair to call me a Luddite 
And like any disciple of Ned Ludd, I don't hate technology. I simply recognize that technology exists in a particular social and political context, and it's often weaponized by the rich against the poor, as Lauren was talking about in their segment. Not only these days, not only are we not allowed to smash the looms, we're not even allowed to criticize this stuff when it doesn't work. Did you all follow the hubbub over the negative reviews of the humane AI pin? Mm-hmm. This is essentially meant to be like a Star Trek communicator badge that you can talk to the commu- computer through, and it sucks. Like, it was savaged by reviewers, even even like by the real reviewers and also by the boosters that typically get sent early products for review. And there was a tweet going around a couple weeks ago after people were responding so negatively to it from Daniel Vassallo, who is... I couldn't actually see the tweet initially when I clicked through to it because I had blocked him at some point in the past. (laughs) But he's promising. He's a tech bro, tech booster, investor type, grind set guy. And he said, quote, I find it distasteful, almost unethical to say this. This is responding to a negative review of the pin. When you have 18 million subscribers. Hard to explain why, but with great reach comes great responsibility. Potentially killing someone else's nascent project reeks of carelessness. First, do no harm. <sighs> Using the Hippocratic Oath to tell somebody that they, that they cannot criticize tech, that's as close as it comes to my deep cover agent activation phrase. <laughs> <laughs> now... As somebody who has taken the Hippocratic Oath, all I can say is, lol. (laughs) I hope it dies. (laughs) I think I mentioned it on the show. (laughs) It's pathetic. Just pathetic stuff. (laughs) As Jason Kebler, a great tech reporter, said, we should clown on this pin forever. (laughs) So I think I mentioned it on the show when it happened about a year ago, but last year one of my classmates asked me if I was concerned at all about the existential risks posed by like a general artificial intelligence. And at the time I told her that I wasn't really worried about it because I felt that there were much more pressing near-term existential threats facing humanity than AI. The global climate crisis, for example, or the ever-increasing wealth disparity both within and between countries. And I feel like we'd be better off worrying about those. Last week, she asked me if I still felt the same way. I'm still not worried about generalized artificial intelligence. LLMs are fundamentally different from anything that we would really call intelligence, and there's no plausible path from the one to the other. I'm also not impressed by the current generation of generative AI, and I'm skeptical that they will continue to substantially improve at the rate that Silicon Valley types claim they will. I think we'll probably see a bunch of these companies collapse in the next few years as they run out of funding and fail to find use cases. These models are still extremely expensive to run. They're still completely unreliable, and they're mostly used for either customer service chatbots or making porn, often non-consensual stuff, which is obviously terrible and we thankfully skipped past on this episode. But I think that this will fade to a certain extent because everybody right now, all of these companies are running these models, which are enormously expensive, at a massive loss, and prices will have to go up. In the meantime, I'm mostly annoyed with how generative AI has flooded the internet with spam and choked out any actual information. And I see that as yet another manifestation of the tech industry's constant focus on short-term profit without any consideration for the long-term consequences. Which is, of course, a feature of capitalism in all its forms. I can't believe we got through this entire episode without mentioning the Voight comp test. (laughs) Right under the wire, Lauren. I did did talk about the sheep. (laughs) (laughs) So if folks are interested in reading more critical reporting about generative AI and tech in general. The folks over at 404 Media, which is a journalist-founded co-op founded by four former motherboard reporters, they do consistently ex- excellent reporting on this stuff. They're at 404media.co. We'll, I'll be linking to a bunch of their articles in the show notes here. Also, Ryan Broderick's Garbage Day newsletter. Garbage! 
Stupid day! Does a good job of keeping up with the latest developments and very sort of short snippets that's fun and easy to read. And the Canadian podcast Tech Won't Save Us, which I've mentioned in the past, also is is pretty good on these things too. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. Who has something nice they want to talk about? Earlier this month, Dave and I were able to take a road trip to Ohio. We changed our plans sort of last minute. And we were able to see the total eclipse, and it was super fucking cool. (laughs) (laughs) We ended up on a rooftop of our host's partner, who was turning an abandoned junkyard slash factory building into community makerspace slash bouldering gym slash if anybody needs an office slash building a tiny home village out back wow that's a lot Uh, of things (laughs) the place next door was like entirely dedicated to event space with apartments on top which is another like you know if we could afford to buy a mansion this is what we would do with it (laughs) and all of their friends were just super cool and welcoming and it was the best little group of weirdo strangers we could have hoped to end up with to watch a really cool astronomical event yeah awesome you got that really great picture of dave pointing at the the full eclipse (laughs) (laughs) yeah speaking of photography of astronomy with your phone taking pictures yeah was we had those little solar filters we were trying to use over our cameras and it was an exercise and frustration (laughs) (laughs) but i'm glad none of them were altered to make me think that i got a better picture than i did (laughs) so i i was expecting i was trying to decide whether i was going to talk about balatro which is great uh or the fallout tv show which is also unexpectedly great but my actual something nice is badminton My eldest has been really into playing badminton lately, and now that it's warm-ish, and she and I have been playing badminton in the front yard every day for like a week, a week and a half, and it's been just lovely. It's been great to spend time with her, just her and me. It's been great to get outside, get some physical activity. And she was very excited when after we were rallying for a while on the first or second day, I said, do you want me to set up the net? And she said, we have a net? (laughs) (laughs) I noticed that when we came in. Yeah. So I said, oh, no, that poor tree. (laughs) Yeah. Our our badminton court, each each side of the badminton court has a tree in it. (laughs) I my partner is Jerry, our small cherry tree. And Kira (laughs) has the the apple tree on her side. Amazing. Wonderful. My something nice is having some extra time and reading some books, both for interest and for pleasure, but none of them are school books. Yay! Yay. (laughs) So that's, that's been nice to have a couple different things on the go, but not because I have a deadline to meet or a discussion post to write or something like that. Mm. So... It doesn't happen often, and I'm enjoying it. I don't have anything that I can think of right now, so I'm just going to second gems something nice from last month. I finally got around to reading Piranesi. Nice. And it was very good. I have some quibbles with the end. Mm, yeah. But it is an excellent book, and it made me go down the wiki rabbit hole onto the actual Piranesi. Yes. Yeah, and why... The character was named after him, and you should do so too. Yeah, those what are they etchings? Yeah, are or like the prints from his etchings are they're cool. bonkers. Yeah, <laughs> imagined prisons or imaginary prisons. It's imaginary prisons of the mind. Yeah, that he like they're different top and bottom, full of both water and it's amazing. Mm-hmm. That's it. Cool. Well, thanks for joining me tonight, everybody. Thank Thank you. you. It was a pleasure, as always, to rant at you. (laughs) Likewise. We have no idea what we're talking about next month. Stay tuned. (laughs) Hopefully something that I know less about, and so Ah. I'll be less inclined to talk about at length. Good night. 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 (laughs) 
Show notes and references for all of our episodes are available at lueepodcast.com, where you can also find links to donate or get in touch. If you'd like to support the show, the best way to do that is with a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you found us, or by sharing this episode with a friend. Life. Don't talk to me about life. So semantics is the study... Uh... Sorry. I am interrupting because the Star Trek <laughs> joke reminded me of this is my the marionette that I made that is Star Trek themed. Oh my god. Oh! Amazing. <laughs> that That is a paper mache Beverly yeah. Crusher? I don't... I don't know if it was any particular character. I just remember that it was Star Trek themed because I think it was a space puppet show that we were doing. Okay, wow. well, it's, it's vaguely, uh, vaguely it's red horrific. haired. <laughs> yeah. it, it's halfway it's between super... a Crusher and a Polanski. Yeah, well, it is. And it yeah. reminds me of that Casey from like Mr. Dress Up. Yeah. <laughs> Casey and Finnegan. Wow. Anyway, the the Star Trek talk just reminded me <laughs> of that. You all needed to see my treasured childhood memories. Yep. I love that this is just going to be peppered with <laughs> Laura's childhood. <laughs> oh, do you want to see my description of what I learned in vacation Bible school? <laughs> <laughs> I think you do. Laura has been cleaning out her, her parents' Okay, so house. this is like seven-year-old spelling, but... Okay, I'm going to attempt to read this. Angels are dressed in white... And they have gold Susa. God has a white cloak, and Jesus has a blue and white cloak. <laughs> she I learned all I, the important bits. What's a gold Susa? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's like I think it's the like the halo. I don't know what the word. Okay. It, so uh, the tenets of Lutheranism, right there. Yes, very important things that I have learned. Is it John Philip Susa? <laughs> No. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, back to the actual good. podcast. I think that is doing. the fastest we've been derailed. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> that can't be the record. As I was saying. <laughs>